and welcome to space. Space where no one will hear you die. Here at the Smash News Network, we apologize for the ridiculous titles that we've been coming up with lately. It all has to do with the algorithm, as somebody over at big tech organizations have done the math. Thanks for tuning in to The Daily Space Weather. I'm your host, Dan, a.k.a. smash mash just bringing you the most comprehensive daily space weather and imagery of the sun you'll find in the known universe. This is the 24-hour video from SDO featuring the 131 and 171 Angstrom's wavelengths, showing a bunch of activity in the southeastern limb especially. We've got a series of coronal mass ejections, cosmic ray report, and lots more to cover, so let's blast through your daily space weather. And let's take a look at what's going on in the southeastern limb, as that is where it's at. And when I say it, I mean the action. Here's a close-up of this sunspot. I believe it's called 3872. And an Einstein quote for you, never memorize something that you can easily look up. And we encourage you to look up and hopefully not see quote chemtrails, end quote. So here is the uh, yesterday plus today's imagery from the SDO intensity gram. We've got a high likelihood of large solar flares in both the southeast and southwestern limbs. Here's a colorized magnetogram for the same period of time. All the action is in the Southern Hemisphere at the moment, although coronal mass ejections are coming out of both the South and North. We'll get to it. First, take a quick moment to check out the links below the video. Today's featured product is Do the Math on Space. Yeah, Do the Math on Space. And that's not just any space depicted in that image. That is the constellation Cygnus. You'll see a bright star right next to the first equal sign just above it. That is the brightest star in the constellation Cygnus, known as Deneb. It's actually a massive X-ray binary at a rather disputed distance. And we're going to talk more about that in a moment. And we encourage you to do the math if you are finding that there are some issues with some of the information being, giving out, being given out, especially on YouTube about space. There are definitely some space hack fraud huckster grifter alarmist imbeciles covering space weather and this is part of our response to all of that do the math big tech did the math and they kind of sucked at it if you know what i mean so let's do a volcano rundown here we've had an uptick at bezzy miani we'll get to it first civiluch civiluch is producing a 13,000 foot plume of volcanic ash as it explodes over kamchatka Flight level 130. Check it out. Bezzy Miani reached 36,000 feet. So that is an uptick at Bezzy Miani. I believe that is the most significant eruption that we've ever covered on the channel from Bezzy Miani. 36,000 foot ash plume, flight level 360 over Bezzy Miani. Suinose Jima, flight level 050, 5,000 foot ash plume. Semeru in Indonesia exploding, flight level 140, flight level 220 over Popocatépetl in central Mexico. Fuego in Guatemala, flight level 150. As it explodes, it's a 15,000 foot ash plume and not sure about Saab and Kaya. Please do not pull vault the caldera. And again, please do visit our links. Here's our earthquake rundown. There's the past 90 days of seismic activity on planet Earth in a convenient bar graph form. We'll scroll up the list. The largest quake of the past 24 was actually a 5.0 in Kukot, China. China. China quake. A quake from China. Okay. That quake was probably built with stolen U.S. intellectual capital. Okay. If that quake had occurred in the U.S., it would have been the most beautiful, the most amazing, the most spectacular earthquake in the history of all earthquakes. Okay. Anyway, continuing on, we'll cite any quakes over a four, over a five magnitude, rather, and, and that's the only one of the past 24 hours. So keep in mind, we say it every day, or any earthquake can be a foreshock. And if you're an earthquake-prone zone, please have an earthquake plan. Know which buildings might collapse. Have a bug out bag. Tell your friends and foes, etc. Have a plan for if the power goes out, brownouts, blackouts, etc. And let's get back to space. Here's the past 24 hours in the spectacular SDO 171 Angstrom's wavelength. I I'm 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 enjoying that. What say you? And 
don't worry, we've got more spectacular imagery of the closest star. First, let's blast through some stats. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux now back down to 136 solar flux units. No forecast for that. There may be a new sunspot rising in the northeast, but so far, only uh, the north, the southeastern sunspot will be the the only major sunspot on the solar disk. After the one in the southwest sets, there's the one-year graph to put it in context for you. The black line is the radio flux. The red line is the sunspot number. And we're seeing a little lull here in solar activity before we get to solar maximum. Now we can expect an uptick in the solar wind in about three days. Uh, but at the moment, NOAA not forecasting any geomagnetic storms or geomagnetic unrest. It's because of a coronal hole high-speed stream, which we will cover here in a moment also. First, let's take a look at the last four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from space. This is our geospace magnetosphere movie depicting magnetohydrodynamic pressure to about 12 Earth diameters. One thing about the geospace magnetosphere movies and ground ma magnetic perturbations maps is that uh, if there are issues with the solar wind data, like likely errors in the solar wind data, this will not be accurate either as it relies on various data points. If you want to know what data points they are, you can read the details tab right down there at the bottom. That'll tell you about the space weather modeling framework, which is the software used to create these models. Here's the last four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from the ground. We're seeing a very diffuse solar wind at the moment. And if that is indeed an error, because keep in mind, different spacecraft may be correctly measuring the solar wind, there may be different density solar wind regimes passing around Lagrangian point one, and that could be affecting the readings. Anyway, that's the past four hours of Earth magnetic moment from the ground, allegedly. Let's take a look at geomagnetism. Currently, geomagnetically calm conditions at 1.33 for the planetary K index, a generalization of planetary geomagnetism. Next, the real-time solar wind. Again, a quick reminder that it is measured out here at Lagrangian point one, about a million miles between the Earth and Sun. And here is the data. So you can see it's kind of all over the place for the solar wind density here. We did see a signal around 1.3 protons per cubic centimeter. Current conditions are showing up as just about, uh, just about two protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, for the density, solar wind speed here below 400 kilometers a second now at 385. The rest of that is pretty unremarkable. Let's look at some magnetic data. There are your GOES magnetometers. Fairly smooth sailing for them. Pretty normal range there for the GOES magnetometers. And let's move to the heliospheric current sheet because there's something important going on here once again as this is very important data. And <clears throat> what we are waiting for is the South Pole current sheet to get split. So there's some indication, if we bring up the latest image here. So there's a latest image. This North Pole magnetism right here at the North Heliographic Pole, it needs to leave the North Heliographic Pole uh, before we can say we're earnestly at solar maximum. So this coronal hole over here is kind of on the Earth side. And this one's sort of on the far side, but it is also near the Heliographic North Pole. So we can expect to see that migrate from there sometime soon. And when we do, you may see the South Pole current sheet get split. You may see a green North Pole current sheet popping in there if this does decide to migrate away from the heliographic pole. And let's take a look at our line of sight field plot next. Here the solar B field is depicted in blue. North solar polar fields in green and red. North solar, pol North solar polar field in green, south, and red. And here's our coronal hole line of sight plot. And I just want to bring up 211 angstroms here real quick. Again, we can expect an increase in the solar wind density in about three days. That'll be the incoming coronal hole high speed streams density wave. That'll be followed by a dip in density and an increase in solar wind speed. So there's a the latest image. A bunch of North Pole coronal holes are all we've got in the Earth facing zone. So all of those dark regions that you're seeing there, those are all North Pole oriented coronal holes, literally all of them. This one is north. This one's north. This one down here is actually north. 
Again, there's the latest image. Welcome to the North Pole, the North Solar Polar Magnetic Region of the Solar System. A great feature of solar cycles. Anyway, here is the sunspot situation. 3270, not 3872, it's 3272. There we go. 3272 is the certainly the place to watch. Uh, the likelihood of it producing large flares is well over 50%. I'm not sure why the flare monitor is down here at 20. It should be up here at like 60%. Uh, it's certainly capable of producing an X flare. Even this area over here is certainly capable of producing an M flare. As it sets, that's 3270. And let's take a look at sunspots here from SDO Continuum. And since the action is happening in the southern hemisphere, let's focus on that. I'll say there's a 60% of additional M class flares from this sunspot and a 40% of M-class flares from this sunspot. Maybe about a 20% chance of an X-class flare from this sunspot. It is certainly quite magnetically complex. And we've even got a close-up of the magnetogram today. We don't always show that. Today we will. Because that is an, not only an impressively large sunspot, but also an impressively magnetically complex sunspot. It's Beta Gamma Delta class. The most likely type of sunspot to produce an X-class flare. So that's what's going on. We're going to get to energetic particles and so forth here in a minute. And there is your GOES proton flux. No relativistic particles showing up despite a large number of coronal mass ejections in the past 24 hours. We'll show those in a minute also. Largest flare of the past 24 hours was an M1.9. Uh, I'm sorry, M2.9. And peak flux was at 140 this morning. Let's take a look at solar flares via the ultraviolet wavelength here, the SDO 131 angstroms. This wavelength takes 10 images per minute instead of only two. Let's zoom in. So this has higher temporal resolution if you want to make slow motion movies. This is 30 frames per second. Uh, if you want to make slower motion movies, you can do that on helioviewer.org. Sometimes for major events, we do indeed slow these down to one-third speed, 10 frames per second. These are all 30 frames per second, and these are 24-hour videos. 3272 is certainly more than capable of producing large flares. Let's also add 94 angstroms here just to show some additional species of ionized iron and their ultraviolet light and emissions. 131 and 94 angstroms are both ionized iron species. It is iron star. Yes, iron star. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about what's going on overhead. This is the situation over Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania here at the moment. You've got Jupiter and the Sun very close together. Also Mercury chasing that duo across the sky. If you're up before dawn, you may see Saturn on the ecliptic. And let's take a look at an article from SciTech Daily. So a quick cosmology blurb here. Uh, and I believe we actually covered this before, but this right here is a galactic core. Uh, that's estimated to be, I believe, 20 million solar masses. It was ejected from this galaxy. And as it's been flying through space at very high speeds, it's produced a basically a galactic string. That's a, a series of blue hot stars trailing that galactic core, which has been likely ejected from this galaxy and moving like a comet through space. It was originally thought to be... Uh, an artifact, but it turns out it's legit. So there's a paper just released two days ago about this cosmic monster on the loose runaway supermassive black hole. Quote, not like anything seen before. So one of the great specters of cosmology is anomalous objects. So that's a 200,000 light year long trail. That trail that we just showed you there is longer than the entire Milky Way galaxy is in diameter. So it's basically creating a long string-shaped galaxy behind it. 
as it blasts through space at ridiculous speeds. So there's the image again. It's from the Hubble. And you can link to the paper at the bottom of the SciTech Daily article. Right there is the link to that, published April 6th in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. Now, we want to talk about Cygnus X3 briefly. Uh, a quick reminder that we do have lots of information about this on the forum, which we'll get to here in a minute. Cygnus X3 is a massive X-ray binary. It's the only known cosmic ray point source that I am aware of. So what we're talking about here is that this is in an ultra X-ray quiescent state. So this is its X-ray, its hard X-ray transients. And you can see it's way down here between 0 0.0 and 0 0.1, which is way down here on the historic graph. So it just left a the longest period ever measured of high X-ray flux, and now it's dropped into an ultra-quiescent X-ray state. That is Cygnus X3, which is also known as the Alpha Cygni, which is actually the star depicted on the Do the Math imagery. And if you want to read more about it, head to smashamash.com slash forum, click on the Cosmology Forum, and there is a, th a thread specifically about Cygnus X3, massive X-ray binary, celestial pole star Deneb. Next, we'll do the Cosmic Ray Report. We cover it at least once a week. This is the Cosmic Ray situation in DOMB Antarctica, and you can see it's a slight uptick over the past 30 days, despite the fact that we are approaching solar maximum. That's DOMB Antarctica. Here's DOMC Antarctica. And of course, our regular viewers may be aware, and maybe not aware, that cosmic ray flux is inversely proportional to sunspot number and the 10.7 centimeter radio flux. So when we see high cosmic ray flux, we see low solar activity, solar minimum. And when we see low cosmic ray flux, we see solar maximum. It's been the situation at least since cosmic rays have been measured. So there's certainly also tree ring data uh, showing the proportionality between carbon-12 and carbon-14 isotopes that tells us that cosmic ray flux and solar activity have likely been inversely proportional, uh, perhaps always. Anyway, that's DOMB and DOMC Antarctica. Slight upticks at those in cosmic ray flux over the past 30 days. Here's Olu, Finland, and a similar graph there, a slight uptick in cosmic ray flux at Olu. Let's go way down south of the land of Mexico, and indeed flat over the past 30 days at Mexico City. Let's go a little bit farther north again to Greece. That is Athens neutron monitor. Athens showing a slight uptick in cosmic ray flux over the past 30 days. And we'll also look at Apatite and Barentsburg. So there's Apatite. Slight uptick in Apatite over the past 30. And also Barentsburg. Oh, Barentsburg showing a slight downtick. So there you go. That's your cosmic ray report. And by the way, if you're not familiar with cosmic rays, they're extremely high-speed particles that come from outside the solar system, and they're moving at such high speeds that they make it all the way down to Earth and indeed through parts of the Earth. For example, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you've had cosmic ray, cosmic ray particles and the associated showers going through your brain for your entire lifetime. So, I mean, I find that pretty interesting, if not creepy. It's pretty weird, but it is just a fact of the way space works. So <clears throat> anyway, that's what's going on with cosmic ray flux. And by the way, cosmic rays are very similar to the solar wind. They're made of essentially the same thing, mostly hydrogen nuclei. Also, the rest of it is helium nuclei, uh, electrons, and then the rest of the other heavy elements uh, may be mixed in there. Traveling at significant percentages of the speed of light, they cause particle showers when they strike things like Earth's atmosphere. Uh, they are believed to likely cause cloud nucleation and so on. We won't get into their effects on climate. Let's do a solar system forecast. Since people are spooked about the alignment between Earth, the Sun, and Jupiter. Yeah, Earth, the Sun, and Jupiter. That has people spooked uh, because of myths about planetary alignments causing disasters and things. Anyway, here's your solar system forecast. This is where things are today on April 8th. Here's where things will be in a week on tax day on April 15th. By the way, don't forget to visit our links. If you want to support the channel, one of the ways you can do it is by entering the promo code SMASHOMASH for your hemp lucid purchases. Thanks to everybody who's picked up items. Uh, the 
Hemp Lucid products are splentacular. We've got some product reviews if you want to see about the packaging and the products themselves. We do have reviews of those on the YouTube channel. Uh, check out youtube.com slash smashomash slash playlists to see some product reviews there. All kinds of great products there from CBDs for your pets to lip balm, body balm, body cream. The most popular are the CBD tinctures. Enter the promo code SMASHOMASH to save some dough on checkout. Or just use our link below the video to do your shopping via our link. Anyway, let's look at some coronagraphs. Here are yesterday's coronagraphs and quite a few CMEs there. Are they earthly directed? Well, we'll get to it here in just a minute. First, we'll look at today's CMEs so far. That's 88 frames from yesterday. Here are an additional 17 frames from today. So another CME happening there uh, in the north-northwestern portion. Also some activity happening around the northern uh, heliographic pole. We'll get to that in a minute. First, let's look at Stereo A and Soho Lasco C3's data. So here's Stereo A on the left, Soho Lasco C3 located also at Lagrangian point one on the right. Here are their coronagraphs. We'll let those play through. And so far, I don't see any indication that any of those CMEs are earthly directed. And of course, let us know in the comments if you disagree. You do see some relativistic particles striking the aperture there, uh, but they didn't make it to the geosynchronous orbits of the GOES-16 or GOES-18. We didn't see any spikes in the proton flux. I don't think those are earthly directed CMEs. What do you think? Again, let us know in the comments. And here's a 24-hour video featuring SDL 193 angstroms, plus the Soho Lasco C2 in red and the C3 in blue. There you can see Jupiter moving closer and closer to the Soho Lasco C2. That should look awesome tomorrow. And here's just a zoom in of the same video, essentially, a little bit higher resolution, of course. And there's another zoom in. Those CMEs do not appear to be earthly directed. And let's just show 193 angstroms by itself because there was quite a lot of activity there. And 193 angstroms is good at showing limb darkening. So for example, sometimes let's say this filament decided to head off in this direction. You may see some darkening of the limb there. And sometimes that is accompanied by Earth-directed coronal mass ejections. So that is something to look at. You can also see that pretty well in 304 angstroms. That's part of the reason why we show 304 plus 193 for our filament views, which we're getting to here in a minute. So there's 193. And let's take a look at filaments, which we've been naming after living people. We've got some here. Uh, this is the uh, the David Lee Roth. And then uh, down here is the, the, the Bill Gates. And then uh, this is like the Klaus Schwab over here. This one here could use a name. So if you want to name a filament, uh, the only way to do it is to join us over on Twitter. If you don't have a Twitter account, you've got to get a Twitter account because you've got to tweet about naming that filament. So if you've got somebody that you want to name a filament after, living people, not ancient ninjas from 15th century Japan, uh, then you can do that on the Twitter feed. Just follow the hashtag name that filament. And join us over there. We're all over the internet at Smash o Mash. You can find links on the homepage at smashomash.com as well as below this video in the description. So lots of filaments. Let's take a look at them in 193 plus 304 angstroms. Huge filaments all around the Earth-facing portion of the solar disk. Likelihood of coronal mass ejections remains at nearly 100%. We can expect to see more fireworks on the coronagraphs today. So there's a southern hemisphere. Again, filaments, filaments, filaments. There's 3272 in its helium plus iron glory. And here's an active region and a massive filament. Really two massive filaments showing up there. And here's the full disk view. A lot of chaotic process, processes currently in effect on the Earth-facing portion of the solar disk. And welcome to the North Solar Pole. Let's subtract the 193 angstroms. 
There's just the ionized helium by itself. And just a quick reminder, the SDO has higher resolution and a lower field of view. So it doesn't it doesn't have a wide as wide of a field of view as the GO16 does, but it's got higher resolution. So depending on what you're looking for, the SDO might be a better choice and the GO16 might be a better choice. So that was a 24-hour SDO video. This is a about a two and a half hour video from the GO16 SUVI. And I would note that up here there's some material swirling around the North Heliographic Pole. So this has been a story that's been covered by a few people like Scott McIntosh and Tamitha Scove. Uh, solar polar cyclonic events happening where we see material swirling around here. And once again, we see some of that going on. You can see some plasma circling around there at the North Heliographic Pole. Also, it looks like some activities starting up around the southwestern limb, the setting sunspot down here. Again, very likely to see especially large flares over here, but maybe also over here as they are more likely as sunspots are closer to the limb. So that's the current situation, which brings us to our bonus features space weather station. We're going to start out with satellite charging hazards since this can show you where errors are likely to occur on your satellite feeds and at the moment it's smooth sailing. No charging hazards here showing up on this uh, satellites community dashboard. Here are our GOES electron flux data from the GOES 16 and GOES 18's radiographic measurements. Fairly high levels of electron flux here and there's the forecast expecting a significant dip here is NOAA. No arguments from me there. Um, and let's take a look at the one-year graph to put it in context. There's the one-year graph from Solon.info. Solon.info is where that is from. That's a one-year graph of the relativistic electrons. They are measured at the F layer of the ionosphere. So let's show the vibrational frequency of that layer. Here's the F layer in megahertz. Millions of vibrations per second. Like many data sets, we show this daily on the channel as we've created a pushing six-year archive of various important space weather factors. Because in science, you never know what is going to be important. So what we often do is immerse ourselves in the data and let the chips fall where they may. And often that leads to weird, creepy, bizarre conclusions that we were not looking for, but keep getting supported by more and more evidence. In the real realm of science, what you want to do, folks, is debunk your own theory. And real scientists work really, really hard to debunk our own theories because, well, we don't want to be wrong. And moreover, we want everybody else to be right and advance the science in good faith. Anyway, here's the latest image of your F layer. That's 1145 universal time. And for some reason, 12 universal time for the ionogram, for the anomaly gram. We'll also show the total electron content forecast. That's the free electrons from the inner portion of the outer Van Allen belt all the way down to your handset. A run of about 12,500 miles. And those free electrons can cause signal refraction and GPS errors of thousands of miles. So here is the total electron content forecast. And we recommend using Wi-Fi accuracy if you're expecting huge errors on your GPS, that'll help you navigate. As we don't want you to be left out in the cold. We don't want you to be left out in the cold with vultures picking your bones. We'll also show the North American electron content anomaly. That's the anomaly uh, in electron count here. So this is the actual count of electrons the same run, 12,500 miles approximately. That's the electron count over North America, the difference from the 10 day average. Last but not least, we'll close out space weather with some high res imagery. 
Let's take a look at this sunspot before it's completely out of sight. It's much more simple than that recently risen sunspot 3272. There you can see the fields. It is beta gamma class, uh, just not particularly beta gamma delta class. This one over here, on the other hand, is a very different story. That is beta gamma delta class, and it's probably got like a hundred umbrae there as far as the sunspot count goes. And you can see huge amounts of magnetic complexity there, opposing fields very close to the umbrae. That is a classic beta gamma delta class sunspot group. I'd say its likelihood of producing a, an X class flare is, I'm going to raise it to 40%. And additional M-class flares are probably like 70% likely from that sunspot. Anyway, here's the full disk rock back. No new sunspots up here by this active region, at least not yet. And that brings us to our meteorology segment. So the first thing we're looking at here are waves, as I am a wave chaser. And the world's largest waves at the moment are just off the coast of Antarctica in the Southern Ocean. Uh, south of the south of Africa, really. And they're about 27 footers. There are some similarly large waves off of Vancouver, but not quite as big as those ones in the Southern Ocean. So it's close. We're also showing currents on this image, so this is going to show ocean currents as well as significant wave height. Let's just switch to sea surface temperature anomaly here while we're showing planetary features. Lots of warm water in the North Pacific and the cold water that was occupying the equatorial Pacific for, I guess, years is now dissipating. And it's very cold on the west coast of North America and very warm on the west coast of South America. Anyway, there's the sea surface temperature anomaly and currents of the Southern Ocean. The Arctic. The Pacific. Don't forget the Indian Ocean. And there is the Atlantic. Brief look at the Gulf Stream. We've got some very anomalously cold water mixed in here. So there's a huge mix there. That water... 11.7 degrees Fahrenheit below normal, but also some very warm water mixed in, like right here, where it's 11.8 degrees above normal. So that is indeed interesting. And we're going to show a snow report, by the way. There is some epic melt happening as forecast. Anyway, here's the current situation for the jet streams over the eastern world. Huge jet stream divergence continues in the western Pacific. Here are the surface winds of this side of the planet. Like sands through the hourglass of time, these are the surface winds of our lives. And these are the jet streams of the western world. chaotic jet stream over the U.S. And these are the jet streams of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And don't forget surface winds. So there you have it. Now we're going to look at clouds and fog over the Americas as we zoom in closer and closer to the lower 48. This is the 3.9 nanometer infrared radiation map, part of the NASA GOES Interactive Weather Satellite Suite. I use them regularly, and my weather forecasting is epic other cyclists are learning to listen to me, and we hope you're able to forecast your own weather. It's just a simple matter of understanding some atmospheric physics, and then it's very easy as you've got more instrumentation than you could ever possibly need. If your location is lit on this map, please click your location and get your weather warnings. Those are hard freeze warnings in parts of southern Pennsylvania. We're expecting it to drop down to nearly freezing tonight. We'll scroll down to show you the key here from weather.gov. Weather.gov is the National Weather Service website. There are more counties for us to cover there, and all that green in the northern part of the U.S., that's all hydrologic output. That is snowmelt flooding. Snowmelt 
flooding. So let's take a look at the state of snow, as we've seen seven consecutive winters of record snow in the Northern Hemisphere. Here's the current situation, and no, we don't cherry pick data, we just report all the facts, and again, let the chips fall where they may. As in the realm of science, we often ask, or ask questions, don't get answers to the questions, end up with more questions, and end up with answers to questions not asked. And thanks for leaving comments, Tin Man 1057. We hope you're, retor we hope you're enjoying your retirement. Also, thanks for leaving comments, Mike and Robert. So, snow mass balance is kind of at the high end of the range here for the 1982 to 2012 average. That's the blue shaded region there for snow mass balance. Keep in mind that does not include mountains. Snow extent is actually kind of on the high side here, but it is within the plus or minus one standard deviation range for the 1998 to 2011 average. That is the two dimensional snow coverage, meaning it does not include snow depth. A dusting here shows up the same as a foot of snow. And last but not least, the snow water equivalent, which is way off the chart. And it's actually recently had an uptick. So snow continues to fall in some areas and lots of rain is coming to some areas and some really warm temperatures are coming to the Northwest also. So you can expect some shocking amount of flooding. It'll be all the disaster pornographers will be certainly in their element. So huge snow water equivalent there way over the plus or minus one standard deviation range for the 1998 to 2011 average. And that is what's causing those hydrologic outputs. Next, we'll show the temperature anomaly forecast. This is the, this is the GFS 72 hour temperature anomaly forecast. And look at all that warm weather. That's anomalously warm weather coming to the Northwest. And the epic snow melt will follow. If you are downstream from a massive snowpack, have an idea of what's going to happen, and please don't drive across, across meltwaters. Maybe have your kayak and your helmet all ready. 72-hour GFS temperature anomaly forecast in degrees Celsius. And by the way, the southeastern U.S. is going to be cold and wet for the next three days. Here's your pressure and precipitation forecast for that same model, the GFS 72-hour forecast see some heavy precipitation there coming to Washington and Oregon, the moistest part of the country. Maybe save for Hawaii. And last but not least, here is your total accumulated precipitation forecast in inches. It is the same model, the GFS 72-hour forecast. Parts of Washington and Oregon there expecting over five inches of rain. Also some heavy rains there for large sections of North, South, North and South Carolina and Georgia. Next, we'll show the windy.com map. And let's just take a look here. We're going to advance this three days and let's see if we can see any significant differences in the amount of snow. So this is the European forecast. We're going to move this ahead three days. So there's a three, three day snowcast for uh, a snow depth forecast for the European model. There's the GFS model. Oh, that doesn't do the forecast for snow depth. So, yeah, it looks like we're going to have some significant reduction of the snowpack here. California is going to have some massive melts, as you can see. As that warm weather moves in, hydrologic output is for insane melting. Next, your NASA goes lightning mapper. I didn't even look at this during show prep. Heavy lightning continuing there around the Gulf Coast and around the southeastern U.S. Do we have any terrestrial strikes at the moment? Well, let's consult a real-time lightning map from lightningmaps.org to figure that out. We've got some lightning in the Gulf. Come on then, there we go. Anyway, that's the current state of lightning. Those are where the teeth of the storms are. We did see one strike here south of Mobile, south of Pensacola. 
So some mild thunder showers happening there around the Gulf Coast. Continuing on, by the way, please visit our links. If you want to support the channel, uh, hit us up on social media. Smashomash.com is our homepage. If you want to see these videos continue to exist and remain publicly visible, consider becoming a member of the Smash team. Drop us a few bucks per month at the gold or silver level. Uh, you, you'll get additional content by being a gold Smash team level, especially. You can find us all over social media. Again, the homepage, Smashomash.com. And welcome to the Neo Renaissance. Apparently, we're not the only folks out there expecting a reawakening as we look at the fundamentals of some science and discover some new things. It's a reawakening about facts and having the ability to criticize nonsense when it comes to science. Anyway, here is the U.S. Doppler radar map. This is where we'll close out our space weather video by showing you the lower 48's weather situation. So that's what's going on. Here is clouds and fog once again. And there is the water vapor map. That should clarify things if you're not sure what's happening with your Doppler. There is a bit of an impulse behind that moisture in the southeast. So this, this is a high pressure zone. And as you can see, it is providing somewhat of an impulse there to the east, maybe a little bit to the northeast. And again, we hope you're able to forecast your own weather and perhaps even your own space weather. Here's a recap to close out the video. U.S. Doppler radar, shortwave radiation showing clouds and fog. And water vapor, which shows all the water vapor. And thanks for tuning in to the Smash News Network, least busted name and news. Congratulations on realizing the channel exists. Don't forget to press like, subscribe, share, comment, etc. We'll see you soon. In the meantime, I'll have been your host, Dan, a.k.a. Smash O'Mash, signing off. And may that solar wind be at your back.